that's what we want to have in mind or keep in mind when we are discussing now the, the afternoon. And first thing to do, and that's directly following up on our discussion on financial markets, is now a session on central banks. Uh, how could central banks uh, react? And we have asked Mark Adam, our um, economic analyst from Forum New Economy, to uh, bring in some ideas or to, to uh, present the basic ideas behind helicopter money, um, just to have a, a basis of, for, for this discussion. I mean, it must not be, and that's the open question, it must not be maybe helicopter money, but maybe it should. That's uh, up to discuss, and maybe there are other ways uh, to, to go ahead and to help the economy recover. Um, so that's what we want to discuss in the panel afterwards. And we have some extremely distinguished uh, people on, on the podium, uh, like Eric Lonergan, who has asked for uh, helicopter money for many, many years and uh, will give us the argument. Peter Bofinger, former member of the Council of Economic Experts in Germany, and Martin Helwig, uh, one of the most distinguished economists uh, in, in Germany and experts on, on financial market questions. So I just hand over to Mark uh, with your presentation and we will lead the discussion afterwards. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas. So I'm sharing my screen. You can hear me well. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to be here on this uh, fantastic panel um, with uh, Eric Lonergan, who is a economist and macro fund manager. Um, I learned a lot, everything I know about the topic, not everything, but a lot I learned from his blog, which I totally recommend. Um, we are here with Martin Helwig, um, professor of economics, uh, who has a brilliant book called The Banker's New Clothes. Um, Daniela Gabo is with, with us, a Twitter phenomena, which uh, really uh, provided me with an in-depth um, knowledge about shadow banking and the politics around international finance and central banking. And of course, Peter Bofinger, who said it, a former member of the Council of German uh, Exports. The panel is, um, what I'm gonna do is uh, provide a short input about this buzzword, helicopter money, that um, has produced such a lot of buzz over the last three months. And um, um, I'm gonna give a precise definition um, about the concept and uh, the history around the concept and what its potential benefits and dangers maybe are. And I will in in describe the institutional differences, um, the different settings across countries. And um, of course, you would start a um, presentation on helicopter money with this famous quote by Milton Friedman. Um, and back then, sort of this concept evolved about, uh, from the Great Depression. Right? Um, the whole discussion between Keynesians and monetarists um, was very much shaped by the experience of the Great Depression. And uh, maybe that's why it sort of disappeared from the radar of economists for some time until it um, got picked up in the early 2000s. Again, um, we're in the wake of Japan's great deflation. Um, and um, Ben Bernanke famously argued that a helicopter growth of money is equivalent to a money finance tax cut. Um, but here you can already see the distinction between those two uh, comments that um, um, Bernanke introduces a fact tax cut and that is effectively a good policy. Um, so um, there's already some blurring um, here. And um, I should point out that one month earlier, Eric Lonergan already um, wrote an FT article in 2002 um, recommending helicopter not only for Japan, but also for the uh, United States, even though in 2002, the US still, the Fed still had some interest rates phase to cut. Uh, but uh, Eric argued that um, interest rates cuts were facilitating consumer spending by inflating house prices and credit growth. Um, they were weakening households' balance sheets. And uh, Eric argued that uh, direct cash transfer, so the more pure form of helicopter money, say, would be prefer preferable. And um, he sort of was right, right? Because uh, we did see a massive um, ho housing price collapse in 2008. It was a uh, um, devastating financial crisis. And um, um, interest rates then were cut um, after the financial crisis to to uh, zero or even below. Um, central banks engaged in quantitative easing, but that 
proved to be sort of in, ineffective. Um, and then there came again those proposals for monetary financing of government deficits. So the Bernanke style helicopter money concept. Um, and you, you would think, okay, was this the time for a paradigm change? Would central banks now resort to more unorthodox monetary policy options? Um, not so fast, because the backlash basically um, came at once. It was only one month after Michael Woodford's speech at Jackson Hole that uh, Jens Weidmann, president of the Bundesbank, delivered a speech in the citadel of pre-crisis uh, central banking orthodoxy. Um, and he recounted the scene um, in um, Goethe's Faust Part Two, one of the most famous um, novels in German literature. And uh, you can see here in this picture how um, Mephisto, the agent of the devil, tempts the emperor into using paper money to finance the government deficit. Um, but all this activity soon gen generates into inflation and destroys the whole monetary system. So, and this picture is actually in the, in the halls of the Bundesbank. It's uh, really big, so you can really see how deep ingrained this um, is in, in German culture, this angst against, angst against inflation. And uh, Germany and other Central European countries actually experienced hyperinflation in the 20th century and have historical reasons to be careful. So uh, we might want to address this uh, if we want to democratically um, um, go towards monetary policy. So um, why would we do that? Why would we engage in, in helicopter money? Well, um, we are in depression territory. Um, some economists didn't think we would uh, be there again, but uh, we, um, we are now in what Ellery Summers has called a secular stagnation, even before, um, before the corona crisis. And uh, there is no more interest rates um, space to cut. I already said this, QE um, seems not to be working. And um, also importantly, we have seen a massive increase in private debt. Um, in overall debt to GDP ratio. And um, this has produced um, credit booms and busts um, and financial crisis, post-crisis recession. It has, it, it has been a drag on nominal demand. And um, so, and one way to get out of this um, massive debt overhang might be the monetary financing of fiscal deficits or helicopter money, um, in, also in its pure form. So, I will uh, try to cut this also brief. This session is basically called, is this then the time for helicopter money? Um, I should again say, well, what do we mean with helicopter money? Is it sending checks to Hong Kong or US residents? Well, if those um, checks like all those tax rebates are financed by an increase in government debt, then that's plain fiscal policy, right? Um, there is the Bernanke style helicopter money already working uh, in the in the UK. The Bank of England has, um, um, I think, a couple of weeks ago, um, increased the size of the uh, of the Treasury's account at the Bank of England. So that would be the Bernanke style the helicopter money. Um, but there's also this dual rate setting system in the eurozone. And um, Eric, um, I know this from your blog. Um, so this is effectively this pure form of helicopter money, but um, people don't have this on their radar yet. It works like this, that you have, a, the ECB has a couple of interest rates it's, it is setting. And one of this, that is the Teltro rate, the interest um, it is lending to banks. Um, but this is in negative territory. So then the interest rate the ECB is lending to banks is negative, while um, banks also park their reserves um, at the ECB and the average rate um, on on those reserves is in positive territory. So you have a inverse spread, so to say. So this is basically um, transferring base central bank base money to the private sector. You might want to argue, well, um, wouldn't it be better to, um, uh, to give it to the households directly instead of the banks? Um, well, I think that's, uh, that's definitely one thing to discuss how we, how we should um, find institutional settings that, um, um, that make use of helicopter money more directly. And I would also point out that it, that the kind of helicopter money, whether um, the Spanaki style or more, the more pure form of helicopter money depends on the country setting. So um, the Eurozone has very different uh, legal in, um, settings. And um, there has also been a lot of talk about modern money, th monetary theory. 
Um, and this is a concept that might work well for the US, but does this intellectual framework um, also apply to the Eurozone? That would be my question. Because um, I think the recurrent drama in the Eurozone exemplifies this. Italy, one of the countries hardest hit by the current pandemic, has seen its fiscal spending increase substantially since the outbreak. But Italy is in a currency union and shares its central bank with 18 other countries, which creates a potential for a default. When markets started to price in this scenario by changing higher interest rates for Italian bonds relative to its Eurozone peers in March, ECB President Christine Lagarde responded that the ECB is not here to close spreads. The ECB then pedaled back and brought the emerging fiscal crisis under control with its pandemic emergency purchase program, PEP. But asymmetries in the Eurozone remain, and it's questionable whether this recurring crisis will be solved without the issuance of a joint debt um, instrument. And um, I will basically leave, um, leave this here. So this is my input, um, that uh, what, what role is then there for central banks? Um, if we if we if we can't have a European joint debt instrument, and um, um, does monetary policy work? Um, should we just trust in PEP? Uh, will PEP be enough if um, governments uh, expand their fiscal deficits, or should we um, actually go for helicopter dr um, drops? And then how would we how would we do this via the dual rate system and tiered reserves? That um, yeah, and um, I will stop my short input here. Um, I think I, that was around 10 minutes. And um, I would then kindly hand over the word to Eric. Um, that's OK. Thank you, Mark. That was, uh, that was great. Thank you very much. And thank you to Thomas and to Simon for inviting me to be involved. I've really um, enjoyed all of the sessions I've heard so far. So uh, thank you all. Um, I'm just going to share some slides. Um, um, OK, so I think the first thing that's very important um, with respect to, to discussing helicopter money, so bear with me. I'm just going to go through a, a few simple definitions. Um, and. The first thing is to, to have a working definition of helicopter money, because I think it's come to mean, particularly uh, via the press, lots of different things to different people. Um, I, I'm just going to define it as money transfers from the central bank to government or the private sector. So it's not just the monetization of uh, budgetary policy which or budgets or government spending, which would be illegal under the Eurozone. I'm also including in it um, monetary transfers to the private sector. And I, so I think that's a first very important distinction. So to me, helicopter money is just uh, central banks creating money and they're either transfer, they're either financing government spending or they're financing transfers to the private sector um, with the creation of base money. Um, now, the other thing I think is very important here is to have a clear distinction between monetary and fiscal policy. And one of the things I find very curious about this discussion is economists rarely, uh, dare I suggest, never clearly define monetary and fiscal policy. Um, and their definitions um, are, are not obvious um, and they shouldn't be assumed. Right? So what I've noticed in, in, from experience of discussions around helicopter money is people just assume we know the distinction between fiscal and monetary policy. And we haven't given nearly enough thought to clarifying it and defining it clearly. Um, so I, I'm going to give a definition of monetary policy. I'm not going to define both. But I'm going to be very, very clear about precisely what I mean when I use the word monetary policy, what I mean by it, uh, and what I kind of think is a, def is a defendable working definition of monetary policy. Now, you will all appreciate um, if there are international people signing, if you're in America, you don't really understand why we care so much about this, but it's obviously critically important because there is a very strict legal separation in the Eurozone between monetary and fiscal policy. So saying that that's fiscal is a problem. <laughs> it has to be monetary. Um, so I will define monetary policy as policy involving the quantity or price of base money and implemented by the central bank. 
So to me, that definition encompasses both a kind of uh, generic abstract component or theoretical component, which is the price and quantity of base money, but also an institutional dimension, which is that it's implemented by the central bank. And I think that is important. Okay, so we've got a working definition of what helicopter money is which is its money transfers from the central bank to either government or the private sector. And we have a definition of what monetary policy is, which is it's the price and quantity of base money and it's implemented by the central bank. So first question, is this the time? Um, and I think it is absolutely the time for helicopter money. And I think something very curious has happened when I look at the commentary of central bank behavior during this crisis, which is there's been this strange sort of collective forgetting we've actually forgotten what the role of central banks is within our macroeconomic system. Over the last 20 years, we made central banks responsible for aggregate demand management. And yet people keep on saying, it's amazing what all of our central banks are doing. They're doing so much. At one level, I sympathize with this, and I want to be very clear. I'm not critical of the individuals at central banks, nor am I suggesting they haven't done a lot but they have completely and utterly failed to deliver on their mandates. Right? It is an abject and complete and utter failure because their mandate is not to stabilize asset markets. And we've almost just assumed that their mandate is asset market stabilization. In other words, they want to keep the functioning of, of financial markets. To Broadly, central banks are succeeding to do that, but that's not what their mandate is. Asset markets are a means to an end. Their job is actually to stabilize effectively to stabilize demand and the current circumstances are slightly diff different but we have inflation targets are a mean to demand stabilization which is really about stabilizing nominal incomes ultimately and we're completely failing to do this so we're not just failing simply to meet the inflation target but we're looking across the developed world where unemployment rates are skyrocketing now central banks are the institutions that we mandated to stabilize this so we have to be crystal clear at the moment we're totally failing now is that failure justified or not that's the key question so do they have the tools to stabilize both current and future output and i, I guess in the current environment we're really thinking about future output because most of the policies we need currently are to allow a full recovery of the economy. So what I really want to say is, is that helicopter money absolutely provides central banks with the tools to deliver on their mandates, and they are not using those tools currently. This is a failure of the mind, and I think we're collectively responsible because no one's even putting pressure on them really to use the tools they've created. So I think central banks themselves have been at the forefront and economists are just lagging hugely behind in terms of what can be done and what needs to be done. Okay, so how can the ECB fulfill its mandate by which I mean stabilize nominal cash flows in the current envi environment in both the corporate sector and in the household sector? I'm less concerned about asset markets because our primary function actually is the real economy. That is what central banks mandate commits them to do. So I'm saying, are they stabilizing the future inflation rate, which means stabilizing effectively, allowing the system to continue to operate in this lockdown? Um, how can they do that? So they effectively have, I think, two broad measures. The first one is dual interest rates, which I'm just gonna briefly explain. I've defined dual interest rates as independently targeting the interest rate on deposits and the interest rates on loans. Now, this is actually a profound break in the functioning of monetary policy, because when one understands the power of dual interest rates, you realize there's no zero bound. There's no liquidity trap. Now, if there's no zero bound and no liquidity trap, there's no excuses for failing to stabilize nominal demand, right? The only argument to say that central banks can fulfill their function is that there's a bound, there's either a reversal rate or a zero bound, or there's a liquidity trap. If neither of those exist, I'm sorry, but you're just not doing your job. Now, why do they not exist under dual interest rates? Well, imagine you have a nationalized commercial banking system and you say, I need to stimulate my economy. So um, I'm going to reverse the net interest margin of the banking system. I'm going to raise the interest rate on savings, and I'm going to start cutting the interest rate on loans. And you keep on persisting with that. Well, that is just a huge transfer 
to the non-banking system from the banking system. If the banking system was owned by the central bank, that would just be a huge increase. You could you create as much base money as you want to finance that transfer. Well, that is uh, an unreserved and unlimited stimulus to the economy. And in fact, this is what the Chinese actually used to do when they owned the banking system, did deregulate their interest rate system in the 1980s. And they could generate inflation and nominal demand at will. What's fascinating is now we have three major central banks have the facility to do this and are doing this already to, to varying degrees. We, the, the Bank of England has a TFS scheme and it has an interest rate on reserves. The Bank of Japan introduced a similar scheme after Fukushima, i.e. a lending scheme that was targeted. And the ECB has actually been way at the forefront of this because the EC, what's most remarkable about the ECB policies during this crisis is they are the first time we've had post interest rate policy by a central bank. And what I mean by that is they didn't cut interest rates. It's actually amazing that they didn't try to reduce the money market rate. I think absolutely correctly. What they did do is they cut the interest rate on Teltros. And I'd refer you, if you haven't read it, to a superb blog by Philip Lane, the ECB's chief economist, who actually explains what they did. So now the Teltro rate under certain conditions, so these are loans made available to banks subject to the banks lending those to the private sector, are actually available at interest rates that are below the interest rate on reserves, right? So in other words, we have two interest rates now in Europe that matter. We have the interest rate on Teltros and we have the interest rate on bank reserves. The ECB can now separately target the lending rate and the deposit rate in the system. Simply put, that gives them limited limitless monetary power. The, the, the debate, and I'm going to come back to this in one second, is, is really about how you target that lending. Right? So, so what loans do you make the banks make available to the private sector? But to give you an example, the ECB could say, we are going to provide 12-month loans at a negative 2% to the banking system. We will pay the banks 20 basis points, and we want those loans to be made up to, to refinance outstanding mortgages, for example. Now, you, you could, the ECB could reprice large swathes of household sector mortgages at negative interest rates, right, which would be a colossal monetary stimulus and income stabilization within the Eurozone. They could do the same for SMEs. They could do the same for loans targeted at sustainable investment. Right? So there is, there is absolutely no reason, no constraint on an un ambiguous monetary stimulus within the eurozone. Now that is a combination of tiered reserves and, 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 and lending, which I'll come back to because I think there are lots of questions around how you might operate that. Okay. Now the key point here is, is that the, the, if you didn't use tiered reserves, i.e. if you didn't alter the interest rate on reserves and use Teltros, effectively this won't happen because the banking system will become unprofitable. But you can do it while sustaining banking sector profitability and you're effectively making a transfer to the private sector. That's point number one. The second thing, which I absolutely think we should put the infrastructure in place for, is to do perpetual Teltros. Now, perpetual Teltros I've just described is, is we're going we're gonna to get around all of the, the, the confusion around bank equity, about making transfers, about printing money. We're going to use a, a loan structure, and we're going to say that every adult citizen in the Eurozone can, has access to a perpetual loan. Okay, so we're going to designate, and, and this, these are just examples. Let's say, for example, we make four banks responsible in each member state. We give the, the administrative responsibility to a member state central bank. Um, and we are now going to do a perpetual loan, which is available to all adult citizens within the Eurozone. The, the main problem problem with this is actually administrative. There's no legal obstacle to this, and we can talk about that later. This is a purely administrative problem, but we're going to give the administrative work to the banking system. Pay the banks 10 basis points to administer, make them responsible for administration. They do money laundering, they do anti-fraud, they do credit checks. So they're going to be administratively responsible for administering the loans. The loans are going to be zero interest rate perpetuals, and the ECB will decide their frequency and magnitude. Right? And I think we should put the infrastructure in place. Okay, if you, with those two tools, dual interest rates and perpetual Teltros, you have all the financial firepower you need to stabilize nominal incomes, nominal cash flows within the private sector. Okay, so in conclusion, and I, I apologize if I'm overrunning, this is entirely a failure of the mind. 
right? This, there is nothing about central banking, there is nothing to say monetary policy cannot cope with this problem. Monetary policy absolutely has the tools. The failures are administrative and the failures are of the intellect. The tools exist. This should be implemented urgently. I think that's blindingly obvious. We have a huge crisis on our hands which could morph into depression. So we absolutely need these policies to be implemented. These policies, I should say, far from being inflationary, are likely to, would prov are, are about fulfilling one's mandate. So th these are prerequisites for the fulfillment of the ECB's mandates. It's not a question of whether they're legal. Arguably, it's illegal not to do them. I mean, if, these, if, if tools are available to meet your inflation target and you're not meeting your inflation target, one should question the legitimacy of an entity. My final point is monetary policy legitimacy, right? And here, I think, again, there's been a huge failure, and I put the failure with us. And by that, I mean those engaged in policymaking within Europe. The European Parliament needs to step up. The European Parliament needs to step up and say, we fully support the Teltro program. Not only do we fully support the Telt Teltro program, if the ECB deems it's necessary to extend the Teltro to households, to corporates, to ESG compliant sustainable investments in our economy, here's how we suggest they should do it. Now there you square the circle. You do not need to have monetary and fiscal coordination in the conventional sense in the Eurozone. You can have legitimate monetary policy if each institution steps up and does its job. Okay, finally, fiscal or monetary, um, this is not an either or. And that's a critical point. Right? I'm in favor of very, very good fiscal policy and very, very good monetary policy. Right? We should not be saying over to the fiscal authorities, over to the monetary authority. Both institutions, economic functions, should be doing their job. And I'm afraid if we're honest about it, neither of them are doing it effectively and legitimately currently. Thank you very much, Eric, for this uh, forceful statement um, and convincing in favor of um, using um, the tools we have and in favor of helicopter money. Um, I would directly um, hand over the word to Martin Helwig. Thank you very much. When I read Friedman's paper in uh, the early 70s, I was surprised that he didn't say anything about land prices. If you drop dollar bills from helicopters, surely that's going to make holding of land more attractive. Of course, if something like that was envisioned today, Austrian economists would immediately say, and the central bank is fueling real estate inflation, quite opposed to what their mandate of course, none of this is serious, but it points to the fact that micro matters and that the mode of intervention matters. And this is where I'm a bit concerned about the appeal to the central banks in the current crisis, because much of what we're dealing with in the current crisis is really about macro, uh, uh, micro. It's very different from 2008. Not all needs are the same. Self-employed, small firms, large corporations, private households, they're all impacted in different ways by the current crisis. For some, there is an issue of demand fall off, of revenue disappearing, businesses being prohibited, supply chain disruptions, payment disruptions. And we're talking about millions of people so I'm a bit bothered by the notion that we can deal with this at the macro level. If we look at the instruments that have been used uh, this morning, the German program uh, was discussed by Jens Sudekum. We have subsidies. We have loans of different sorts. We have equity participations. Again, much of that requires strongly contingent choices. One issue about this is, is the central bank in a legitimate position to take such choices, or is this something where the political authorities must ultimately take the decisions? Of course, we have a history of central bank subsidies to commercial banks, 
like uh, Greenspan's turnaround in 1990, which allowed commercial banks to play the yield curve for four years. But many of those instances are actually uh, quite scandalous because commercial banks are being treated as privileged private entities. Even for political authorities, dealing with a situation like the current one is very difficult because they don't really get at the private households or at the small self-employed entrepreneurs. And they have to go through commercial banks. What do commercial banks do? They try to back blackmail the government. Like, you need to guarantee 100% of those loans. That's the sort of concern I have uh, about the way in which the system is actually unable to reach to the full micro level and reliance on the commercial banking system in that respect uh, provides lots of rooms for commercial banks to do strange things. Of course, that would also apply to the expansion of TLTRO that uh, Eric was talking about. Moving on from the current crisis, I want to turn to the secular problem. In Germany, we've had uh, about 10 years of debate between someone like Christian von Weizsäcker and say Stefan Homburg on, are there enough stores of value? Uh, this parallels the US discussion with uh, Summers and Blanchard where Weizsäcker's argument is simply that if you look at simple measures of saving both in flow and in stock terms, there is no way the stock of real assets uh, will catch up with that. There are concerns about dynamic inefficiency of the sort that we know from growth models, where some people say dynamic inefficiency cannot arise. I don't want to go uh, into that. It's uh, much of that is not to be taken seriously. But then we also have in the literature on dynamic inefficiency that you can always handle dynamic inefficiency by having a bubble. In a standard overlapping generations model, you use a paper asset that doesn't do anything other than exist in order to satisfy the demand for a store of value. With full flexibility, equilibrium allocations with bubbles tend to be efficient. What does that mean? It means that if, say, there is a shock to the demand for such a store of value, the shock should be accommodated by changes in the value of the bubble, and that's all we need. The alternative, which is the Weizsäcker Blanchard position, would be the shock should be accommodated by changes in the size of the bubble, i.e., central bank printing money or withdrawing money, or the government's doing the same thing with public debt. We don't have a good understanding of how to decide that debate. To some extent, it's a version of the debate about wage rigidity in chapter 19, there's a status of wage rigidity in chapter 19 of the general theory. But I su suggest it should be amplified by a consideration of Irving Fisher's uh, pointing to debt deflation as a problem. Meaning when demand for the store of value goes up, you don't really want the value of the store of value to go up because that would cause problems for all debtors under nominal contracts. The Austrian position on that issue is remarkably dishonest. In the analytical parts of the books by Mises and Hayek, they say debtors need to be deflected to be defended from the consequences of changes in the purchasing power of money. In the policy parts, they say we need the gold standard and we should let def deflation of purchasing power run its uh, course. What does this have to do with monetary policy? So far, I was just talking about the bubble. 
who adjusts the size of the bubble? If I depart from Eric's definition of monetary and fiscal policy and go back to the one given by Tobin in the 1960s, fiscal policy determines the size of the bubble and monetary policy determines the structure. Open market operations change the structure of the bubble. And you might say similar things about lending to banks. Helicopter money as a way of combining money creation with a change in the size of the bubble. But of course, if you change the size of the bubble, why not target it directly to fiscal policy purposes? And I don't think it's an issue about MMT working or not working. We're currently simply in a situation where the breakdown in the monetary system is such that inflation is not even uh, an issue. So my point would be that we strongly should talk about the need to have more government debt along the lines of Weizsäcker and Blanchard. And then we get into the question, should we talk about monetization of that? Of course, in the European context, we supposedly have a prohibition on monetary financing of governments. And I must alert participants here that on May 5th, the German Constitutional Court is about to pronounce on the subject with respect to quantitative easing. I'm quite apprehensive about that. An interesting feature in that respect is the prohibition is not actually stated as such in the treaty. This treaty, treaty has a prohibition on direct purchases of government debt titles from governments and no prohibition at all on open market purchases, secondary market purchases. Any notion of a sort of substantive prohibition of monetary financing of, government, of governments comes from the courts and the lawyers throwing in additional terminology, which moreover is unclear. What does the term prohibition of monetary financing mean? Well, surely it means that in contrast to Italy in the 1980s, the central bank cannot be obliged to buy whatever the market doesn't buy. Does it impose limits? Unclear. It's all a question of legal interpretation by the courts. Unfortunately, the court cases that we've had have proceeded to impose procedural limits and proportional limits, such as not more than one third of the debt issued by that government, which are becoming binding. And the ECB has declared that we, it won't be bound by those limits in the current situation. But there we are headed towards a potential conflict between the ECB and the courts. That's where I am. Thank you very much, Martin Helwig, um, for this fascinating um, input and touching about uh, on a number of points. Um, um, the legal issue is, of course, highly relevant. And uh, as you said, the court decision is up soon. I would point viewers to our final um, session this evening where Katharina Pistor, a legal expert, is also speaking. So that might be interesting for our viewers. But I would uh, hand over the word directly to Peter Bofinger, please. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you for inviting me. And um, well, let me just start with a very short remark to what in my view, uh, Milton Friedman had in mind when talking about helicopter money, in my view, he never had in mind to use this as, a, as an advice for practical policy. I think his idea of uh, helicopter money is simply due to the necessity to find a role uh, for the central bank in the classical uh, model of the financial market. I think that's a problem. The classical model of the financial market, uh, it's a kind of commodity model and there's no role for the central bank. And then he was asked, people were at the problem to explain what is the role for the central bank. And the argument is, yes, they, control the price level, but how can they control the price level 
in this classical model, um, they can't do it. And so the only uh, uh, way out for Fried was, was saying, well, just let's throw money out of from the helicopter and this uh, then uh, raises the price level. So in my view, the helicopter idea of, of Milton Friedman shows simply uh, the, the flaws of this classical model of the financial market where you don't have a role for the central bank and now with helicopter money you somehow try to solve this but I think he never had it in mind as a practical policy uh, idea. Okay, next slide please. So if you now talk about Corona and, and the role of central banks in dealing with Corona, I think it's important to regard uh, Corona, the economic effects as a kind of debt, as a kind of debt wave, waves that are generated uh, by, by the, these closed downs, by the lockdowns uh, that are generated by the interruption of inter international supply chains. And uh, the economic effect, in my view, can be described by this three wave model that I think that you can see here. Uh, first of all, the corona tsunami, as they call it, it's the real economy, so the service sector, the manufacturing, the self-employed, and the effect is simply that revenues break down, and uh, at the same time, the, the firms, the companies, the self-employed, have to make fixed payments for wages, rent, leases, interest, debt, and, uh, and debt redemption. So they, the revenues break down, but they still have to make payments. And if nothing else happens, so if they are not supported by the government, the debt of this sector goes up. And without any help from the government, then this wave continues hitting the commercial real estate sector which no longer receives payments uh, for rents and leasing but still it has to make payments uh, to the to the to banking system and if, again if nothing happens then the first and the second wave hit the financial system hit the banking system which uh, has no longer revenues from interest payments from debt redemptions and and still of course the banking system is obliged to maintain the value of its deposits so if you don't do anything, this, this tsunami hits the real economy, the commercial real estate sector and the financial system. And the interesting thing is uh, that, that the leverage ratio of these sectors is, is, is going up. So the real economy has a relatively small leverage sector, the commercial real estate sector has a higher leverage factor. And of course, the financial system is, is most highly leveraged. So I think that's the challenge uh, which is posed to, to policymakers. And um, in my view, the, the, the task is now to contain this dead wave in the real economy, preventing it from destroying the commercial real estate and the financial system. So the idea must be to stop the wave here in, in the real economy. And this also then makes clear what kind of policy measures you need. I think we, there's a lot of talk about these guarantees, about the bazooka of the German government, but these are all guarantees and they do not stop they do not stop the building up of dead waves. I think that's the real shortcoming uh, of these fancy uh, programs that, that there's very little to help the companies with their, with, their, with, their, with their increase in debt. I think there's one important exception that is short time work that really helps uh, to reduce the fixed payments uh, for, for wages. I think that's, that's very good. There's also for the very small ones, there, there are these, these special programs where the self-employed get 5,000 or 9,000 9, or 15,000 euros as direct transfers. And there's also the idea in Germany that if you have more than 250 employees, that maybe you get capital infusions by the government. But there's a huge gap between companies with 10 to 250 uh, employees uh, who do not get any, any capital uh, injections. So, uh, in contrast to what Eric said, I think it's really the fis fiscal policy that is required because only fiscal policy can, can support uh, in a targeted way those uh, companies and firms that need it, that those companies and firms that are confronted uh, with this dead wave. And if you see the dead wave as the main metaphor, it's also clear that lower interest rates are not really essential. They help a little bit, but the over, overarching challenge is, of course, to deal with this with this debt wave, and I think that's that's where fiscal policy is needed and must do much more than than we had so far. And next slide, please. So, of course, now asking for a very comprehensive support uh, by the government, especially for the for the small and medium-sized firms, raises the question: What are the financing limits? And um, 
you can see all over the MFS has presented uh, the, the forecast for debt levels. I think Japan will reach more than 250% and, uh, and, um, and Italy will reach more than, than 150%. Um, and, and so the question is what, I forgot one point before mentioning this, I think what, what is really the task of the government now is to take the debt level, the debt that increases inevitably due to Corona, to take this debt out of the private sector into the government balance sheet and then we come to the role of the central bank. Of course, the best way to finally store this debt is in the central bank uh, balance sheet. I think that's the, the main logic of what the central bank can do, helping to get the private debt, the debt out of the private sector, preventing the debt, destroying the financial system, getting it into the balance sheet of the government. And from this, then uh, the best way to, to get the debt uh, st finally stored is, is in the central bank. And I think that's the main, main idea, I think, of, of this modern monetary theory that argues that large countries that are indebted in their own currency do not face any financing restrictions because they can always finance themselves directly through their national central bank. And I think that's the key insight that we need today when we are faced with this terrible challenge of coronavirus where we do not know, know how long it will last. I think the only positive me message is governments are able to support the private sector in a very comprehensive way because governments can take the debt away out of the private sector and they can have the, they have the central bank uh, financing the whole thing i think that's that's a really important message uh, and um, of course modern monetary theory, or theory always insists that if by there is no financing restriction there's always a a restriction by the availability of goods and, and, and services, which must be considered if you want to avoid inflation. But under the current situation, I think that's definitely not a very binding constraint, especially if government deficits only fill the holes in the private balance sheets, then uh, government intervention helps to prevent a serious deflation, but it does definitely not cause inflation. I think that's really uh, important and I've described it more in, in, a, in a column for Social Europe. And so the main problem, if, if one can see uh, the, this logic of modern monetary theory and the potential that this theory offers for, for, for government intervention in such a crisis, um, the only problem is that in the Euro area, we have the problem of countries that are not indebted in their national currency, but they're indebted in Euro, um, that we do not have a federal level and in this regard, I think we definitely need solutions. Uh, however you, you call them, I think what is required is that you need a financing scheme where the debt is not attributed to the national uh, governments, uh, which would increase, especially in the case of Italy, debt levels higher. So debt should be attributed to the European level and all the funds that are distributed by this uh, scheme should be transfers and not loans. And that explains why the ESM is definitely not a good solution. But I think there are now lots of proposals which go in this, in this direction. So next, please. Well, we could, could do that shorter so you can see that in the second and first world war uh, that countries like United States and UK were able to increase their debt by huge amounts. And next slide, uh, next slide, please. And you could see there was not there was some short spikes of inflation, but definitely not an inflationary problem. And Japan, you can see on the right, is the key case where you can see that even a huge amount of government financing, uh, a huge amount of central bank finance, government deficit and debt does not lead to inflation. It just uh, is still a situation where deflation is a more serious threat than, than inflation. Next slide, please. So helicopter money. Um, I think it's, it's not a good idea because it's not a targeted form of support. Uh, right now, not all households require financial support. They are the pensioners, they are the people in the civil service, there are many, uh, many households who do not have a, a, a decline in, in their incomes. And what I th think is essential is the support for balance sheet repair, especially of the small and medium-sized enterprises. And that's not something, something you could do with helicopter money. Um, and and uh, with helicopter schemes. And I also don't think that the central bank would be the right institution to do, to do this balance sheet uh, repair. And 
Well, as long as we have shut down, um, the stimulation of consumption could be also counterproductive. After the shutdown, I think a targeted uh, support for restarts uh, of the economy is, is also a better solution, especially, for instance, by lowering indirect taxes for those firms that were most seriously affected by the shutdown, like restaurants or hotels. And in addition, I think um, it should, funds should be also used then for targeted support of ecological transformation, for instance, in electromobility. Last slide. So in my view, the corona crisis leads to an inevitable increase of debt. Um, if this debt remains in the private sector, it will destroy the real economy and has also the potential to destroy the financial system. Therefore, the debt must be and can be transferred to the public sector. And uh, in, the in the public sector, uh, the central banks are the obvious final storage for this debt. And in my view, helicopter money as an untargeted measure is not an optimum solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. So I hope um, I'm oh. sorry about the slides, but maybe Daniela, you could try if it works for you. Otherwise, ah, this looks good. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Oh. So I hand over the, the word mm -hmm. uh, right to you. Uh, okay, let's see. So thank you for inviting me. Um, I think it would have been nicer to be in Berlin than in my living room for this, but uh, here we are. Uh, I thought I would be, since I'm the last one, I thought I would be a little bit uh, provocative in the arguments that uh, I make. Uh, and I want to make three points. Uh, I would argue and agree with uh, Peter Boffinger that helicopter money is a very poor patch on a big euro area wound. And I'll defer to, the, to what the ACB can do here, but maybe we can extend the discussion later. Um, and then uh, why is it a, a poor patch on a big euro area wound? Because uh, the financial architecture that we have in Euro and the, the Euro area and the financial structure we have in the Euro area hardwires an exorbitant privilege for Germany and for its bonds. Uh, and that uh, exorbitant privilege is preventing uh, fiscal policy in member states from taking over a sort of the burden of dealing with this unprecedented crisis. And I would propose lastly that the ECB, so what should central banks do, that the ECB should have a permanent helicopter spread uh, policy. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, so um, I think uh, Peter Boffinger has explained this uh, very well. Uh, I would agree that uh, the kind of de-risking that uh, uh, helicopter money sort of implicit, it implicitly assumes via tiered reserves or dual uh, uh, rates doesn't work very well. It doesn't work very well for, I would argue, three reasons. First, because it assumes there will be demand for loans uh, in, a, in a highly depressed uh, economic space. Second, because it would privilege uh, uh, commercial banks, as Martin Helwig has alluded to, and rely on, on commercial bank the commercial banking sector. And I think it's a problem to rely on commercial banks because a lot of what we think about, about banking in the euro area is not the standard loans and uh, uh, deposit creation, but has to do with market-based finance or shadow banking. That is activities in securities markets, in, in the repo market and in uh, uh, derivatives markets. Uh, take, so if we start from this uh, logic of, the, of uh, what is the financial structure of the euro area uh, and how does it influence the effectiveness of monetary policy and of, and of fiscal policy, uh, I would argue that the financial structure that we have now creates an architectural privilege for uh, German bonds and it sort of uh, hardwires the specific policy preference of preferences of Germany into what can be done at the national level and at European uh, level. Uh, and I want to talk about this by thinking about the relationship between the central bank and the, and the monetary and the fiscal po policy or the fiscal arm of the state as a, a, a history of an unhappy marriage, uh, one way or another, uh, and remind ourselves that during Keynesian aggregate demand management, the central bank was a had a subordinated function through monetary policy in order to peg uh, bond prices for the sovereign who did uh, or the, the heavy lifting in terms of aggregate demand management. We have moved far away from that uh, with monetarism and inflation targeting, and under the logic of an independent central bank that both this policy framework hold, uh, there is a de jure separation between what monetary policy is doing and what fiscal policy is, is doing. But if we look through a financial mar uh, market structure kind, uh, lens, 
what we see there is that uh, the uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy have never been truly and properly divorced from each other because of the importance of the repo market uh, that connects them in complex and, uh, and I would argue quite political ways. So uh, the uh, sovereign goes or uses the repo market in order to generate liquidity for, for its government bonds. But in doing so, it also creates a financial stability questions for the central bank because for the last 20 years, sovereign bonds have been viewed as the safe asset for market-based finance. This is uh, where uh, market-based financial institutions who have large uh, collateralized liabilities in order to finance their uh, activity, this is where they run uh, during bad times, they run to what they perceive to be the safest asset, the one that preserves the uh, um, ability or the, the, the collateral power of, um, uh, of that security. Uh, and we know that there are significant financial stability issues in market-based finance through leverage and, and, liquidity, and liquidity cycles. And these financial stability issues can spill over into the sovereign bond market and they can affect the ability of the sovereign to do fiscal pol policy. Uh, in the particular context of the euro area, what, what we had for the last 25 to 30 years a deliberate uh, policy choice to promote market-based finance. Uh, we can go back to the Lamfalus C process to, uh, in order to think about it. Uh, and what this has created is a very large and very systemic uh, European repo market where Germany gets an exorbitant privilege simply because every time things go wrong, uh, financial institutions uh, run to uh, the safety of, of German bonds. And that creates political uh, incentives for Germany to not want to change this architecture because it would uh, lose that exorbitant privilege. Uh, this is a, a graph that to my mind illustrates very well uh, how that um, exorbitant or architectural privilege, is, privilege uh, works for Germany. As you will see, Germany uh, spreads of uh, Germany over Euro Eurozone have been consistently negative uh, since the creation of the Euro, which uh, is not a surprise, but if you look at what happened during uh, from 2008 up to uh, Mario Draghi's whatever it takes, he, you see that there uh, the safe asset status of uh, the German Bund um, in, in action. And incidentally, QE and um, the PEP program now are the kind of policies that are reducing that architectural privilege simply by saying that the European Central Bank will be a, a national bank for each uh, member state as opposed to a, a Eurozone bank uh, for Germany. Uh, there is, I think, in the, in the policy world and in the central banking world, there is a clear recognition to my mind that this asymmetric privilege is there and it is detrimental. Uh, here, a quote from Landau arguing that uh, we need a more mo a symmetric monetary system in order to overcome uh, the asymmetries of uh, safe asset privilege and that central banks should care about uh, the, the spreads in the Eurozone simply because uh, this is a question of financial stability and a question of moneyness as, a, as opposed to a question of uh, fiscal policy. Uh, unfortunately, since 2008, although we know that this uh, asymmetric privilege has been built uh, in, we have not put in place in the Eurozone the kind of policies that would be nece necessary to reverse them. Uh, and the fact that we have not managed to create a, a different institutional architecture has led us to a standard macro finance mix that, that combines during bad times, conditional monetary activism, and that goes from OMPs uh, to, I would guess, uh, ESM in, to some extent, uh, and PEP to fis and fiscal austerity. And fiscal austerity because governments who are worried about spreads see no other way out uh, but to try to commit to a, a lower, a, a sort of or a tighter fiscal uh, policy. And we see that this is a problem in this crisis where Italy is being uh, quite severely affected because even with the interventions of the ECB and with a promise uh, of Christine Lagarde, uh, spreads to Germany are climbing again. And um, Italy is very important in this story because Italy is the, the, has the second largest sovereign bond market in the Eurozone uh, and its uh, uh, collapse uh, would have very significant uh, uh, financial stability consequences because it would basically collapse the European repo market. Uh, from this perspective, then what we need to do is to, uh, what the, the central bank has to do in order to meet the demands of a, of a financial structure like the one that the Eurozone has, is to have a, a policy of permanently targeting spreads uh, of every Euro member state to, to Germany. 
uh, and I guess in this picture, I think it's a, there is a kind of hidden message from the Eurozone architects that uh, spread targeting should be what the, the central bank is doing in those, in those two lines. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Uh, the, we need to take policies in order to reverse the architectural privilege that Germany is benefiting and to create fiscal space for uh, member states in order to deal with the uh, 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 downfall from the pandemic. And that would require some form of coordination between uh, monetary and fiscal policy to ensure that not only Germany, but other countries have liquid and transparent government bond markets. And in, in the future, that would also be very important for the Green New Deal. And uh, in, in, uh, if, if that, the, that should be a permanent solution until we have a, uh, another uh, form or institutional commitment towards creating a single safe uh, asset for the Eurozone that could come in the form of Corona bonds, Euro bonds, or perpetual bonds. However, we want to describe this, to my mind, they are a, a, at their core, not fiscal policy instruments, but they are a, a new way of, of addressing uh, the particular uh, complexities and uh, weaknesses that the Euro area financial uh, structure creates. Uh, I will stop here so we can take questions. You can see uh, these arguments are based on research that I've done on the European uh, market-based architect architecture, and there is a video from last two year in Berlin where I explained this in more detail. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. So we uh, heard a couple of statements now from the speakers. So I would like to give the speakers the opportunity to respond before I take some questions from um, from the other panelists here in, in Zoom. Um, Eric, would you like to respond? Yeah, uh, let me just make a quick set of observations, because I, which uh, again I find a very intriguing discussion, um, and I th it's almost as if nobody wanted to discuss helicopter money. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, um, so let's say I take Daniela's idea about targeting spreads. So I've been advocating that the ECB should target the gap between the lowest and the highest spread in the eurozone. So they should say, we will not tolerate a spread wider than 50 basis points from the lowest yield of a sovereign in the Eurozone to the highest yield. That's fine. That's yield targeting. That's a good idea. That will help because that will help the budget constraint on, on sovereigns. Targeted fiscal policy is a fantastic idea. I agree with everything that, that, that Peter and Martin said on this, which is we should have optimal fiscal policy. But if you remember, the last point I made was monitoring fiscal policy are not substitutes. It's not a question of either or. Let's have, of, how can I argue against optimal fiscal policy? We should have fantastic targeted fiscal policy. We should have yield targeting. I don't disagree with any of that. The point is, monetary policy is failing to fulfill its mandate. How is monetary policy going to fulfill its mandate? Does it have the tools to fulfill its mandate? Now, effectively, the criticism, two criticisms against um, dual interest rates. There was no criticism I noticed. Nobody mentioned perpetual teltros. Right? So perpetual teltros would effectively be transfers to all adult citizens. I don't see why. I think maybe Martin referred to that, but I don't see why that's... Martin made the point that the problem with monetary... The problem with... He implied it was a problem with helicopter money. It's actually a problem with all monetary and fiscal policy, which is none of them are perfectly targeted. Most other forms of monetary policy are far, far poorly targeted than what I'm proposing, or than what the ECB is doing with Teltros, which start with the word targeted. Right? Most of the time, monetary policy just changes an interest rate or it changes an asset price. It pays zero attention to the distributional consequences, and there is effectively zero targeting. So whenever you change interest rates as a transfer from savers to borrowers, which has no targeting. So that is just a, f a feature of monetary policy, but that doesn't mean you don't do monetary policy. Monetary policy still has a mandate, and you still have to do it. So the problem of targeting on a fade relative to the counterfactuals, you can't measure it versus perfect targeting, which is an, an ideal that we will never obtain. The question is, can you make it more targeted? And is it better than what you're doing as it is, which is negative interest rates, existing teltro programs, massive asset purchase programs, which I would say are totally indiscriminate and totally untargeted. So you can hugely improve on the counterfactual that's available to you. A final point, which is, uh, Daniela says dual interest rates assumes demand for loans. It absolutely does not assume demand for loans. And she says it privileges commercial banks. It absolutely does not. If, if dual interest rates required new borrowing in the conventional sense, I would not be advocating it because I don't believe commercial banks want to lend more money. 
here's how you use dual reserve, you use dual interest rates in a way that neither privileges banks nor assumes demand for loans, is you reprice all existing outstanding loans. So if you simply say the next Teltro program is going to be, you know, X, X percent of what existing programs have been, let's say you do a tr another trillion of Teltros, and you say that it is only available subject to the repricing of SME loans to a negative interest rates of 50 basis points. All you're doing is refinancing existing loans, so you don't need any new net demand. You're just offering people a lower interest rate on their loans, not on their deposits. And those loans go to a negative interest rate. Not only would you automatically eliminate defaults within SMEs, but you would also improve the cash flow of SMEs because they wouldn't have to make an interest payment and they'd receive a check in the post. So you can absolutely, under a Teltro, target to sectors, there will be some SMEs that are fine, but that's gonna be the same with every single policy. Um, and, and also that's not the counterfactual. So the key point here I think one has to make is it's an absolute error to start going on to what we think optimal fiscal policy looks like. That's not an error, that's a separate discussion. Yield targeting is a separate discussion. The question here that I think we're being posed is we are singularly failing to meet our inflation targets. We are using QE, asset purchases, negative interest rates, very, very modest um, dual interest rates, which are largely supporting commercial bank profits. The question is, are there other monetary policies, tools available to us, which could be more direct, more effective, and allow us to fulfill our mandate? That's the question. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, so Martin Helwig, I think um, Eric uh, took on your point about the different microeconomic effects um, that actually monetary and fiscal policy is never perfect, um, but that uh, we could try to tackle those if we, um, if we structure the, um, the dual rate setting system appropriately. Uh, would you like to... Um, um... There are two issues there. Uh, the question raised was, is this the time for helicopter money? And uh, my interpretation, and I think uh, Peter's as well, was this refers to the current corona crisis. And our answer was uh, the current co corona crisis requires a kind of targeting that the central bank is not good at doing. So the answer to is this the time for helicopter money was simply no. Uh, would we want to have a more targeted helicopter or central bank activity altogether? Of course, I cannot answer for Peter, but for myself, I would say I would be nervous about that. And that includes such things as the central bank doing green finance or whatever other good purposes you use. The reason being that the moment these things becomes very political, there is something inappropriate about having a body of appointed bureaucrats take the final decision. Political evaluations should be taken by political bodies, which is why I think that uh, schemes of, well, monetary financing of governments in the sense that the governments issue the debt and monetary policy buys up some, maybe not, but in any case shapes the structure of the paper assets that are around. I think that that has something to be said for it. And instances where the symbiosis of central bank and commercial banks went beyond that actually have usually given rise to scandals. I would like to add a comment on Daniela's presentation. I'm fully appreciative of the fact that Germany has drawn huge benefits out of the system of the past 20 years. That being said, don't fool yourself into believing that that's, that is all there is to the story. If you begin the story in 1970, and you look, for example, as, at spreads 
pre-European monetary union, if you look at the various exchange rate crises, you find that the German problem has haunted the rest of Western Europe much before European monetary union. And in fact, European monetary union was created because Mitterrand thought, that's a way I can discipline the Bundesbank. I'm not sure that the French prefer today's system to the one they had 30 years ago, <coughs> but it would be too narrow to deal with this issue just in terms of Germany has exorbitant privilege. The privilege has sources that are older than the current institutional arrangement, and these sources do have something to do with the makeup of the political system. I'll add, and by the way, any trade unionist in Germany will tell you that this exorbitant privilege that Germany has as a creditor went along with exorbitant costs for workers and trade unions. So uh, there was a distributional conflict within Germany. But uh, this is moving a bit aside, except that I think it's dangerous to formulate the problem just in those terms. Thank you very much. Um, on your first point, uh, initially when we did this, uh, um, prepared this workshop and it was still called how to prepare for the next crisis, we were actually thinking about naming this session, is this the time for green helicopter money? Um, <laughs> that, should, uh, um, that should definitely not be the job of central banks. And um, I'm, I'm, I guess, uh, Peter Bofinger, you would agree um, that uh, this is fiscal policy's job. I think you had this in your slide. Um, but but then isn't the ECB the one macroeconomic institution or like the one institution in Europe that is able to handle the crisis? Um, and so or maybe you want to reply to what the other panelists said. Yeah, uh, first of all, the idea to to, re to use uh, the lending rates for, for, for companies by providing uh, the banks with very generous uh, uh, long-term refinancing uh, operations. I'm not sure whether the size is fixed. I think there's a relatively small amount of the refinancing compared to the total amount of outstanding loans. So I'm not sure whether you can really, by, by generous uh, conditions for these targeted uh, altros, can, can compensate the banks for, for reducing the interest rates for their whole uh, outstanding amount of, of, of loans. So I think we have to have to check this. I'm not I'm not sure whether it will work. And in addition, as I said, in the in the current situation, it's it's not so much about uh, the interest payments; they play a role, but it's really the increase uh, in in, uh, uh, in 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 debt uh, which which matters. And even if this debt is is a little bit uh, at lower interest rates, it's not so much a problem. And in the case of Germany. Uh, we have these these government guarantees up to 100% where banks where, where the uh, where the interest rate is is two or three percent. So the, the the possibility to get money at low interest rates is already there. So it, I'm not sure that this would really help. Okay, thank you. Um, so final response from Daniela be, because we also have uh, some questions uh, from the other audience. Uh, okay, thank you. Um... I think I think I would I would just address first the question of the exorbitant privilege because uh, I want to clarify a couple of of things. And you're right, Martin. I did not make a historical account of uh, the exorbitant privilege, and I guess uh, we all know quite well the history of the euro had to do with trying to remove the the uh, dominance of the Deutsche Mark from the way in which uh, the European countries were relating to each other. And we know that the French failed in their attempts. I, I, would, I would think from how the financial uh, system in Europe looks now and how uh, political decision make, uh, making looks now. But still, uh, I'm not quite sure why you think it's dangerous to frame it like that. I, I, I agree that there are distributional consequences that, uh, inside Germany from uh, the way in which the uh, architecture of the euro uh, generates exorbitant privileges, yes. But uh, we also have, to, I think it's a valid point to raise that uh, Germany has no political incentives to agree to any reform of the macrofinancial architecture that would allow fiscal policy to work better in other member states, uh, or at least to isolate fiscal policy from 
the, uh, the kind of leverage cycles and liquidity spirals that are generated through the way in which market-based uh, finance works in Europe. So to my mind, if we don't put this on the table and don't deal with this, I'm not quite sure why is the, why is the euro then not a failed experiment and what, what keeps us together in the euro area. And I'm saying this as a Romanian who will eventually join uh, the euro, hopefully in a very, very distant future. Uh, I, I think this we need to take into account because discussions of whether helicopter money or, or, uh, is relevant or not have to go through what is possible to do with the macro institutions that you have at the moment. And with the macro institutions that we have at the moment, a lot can or cannot be done depending on what the, uh, I would say, the, the greatest winner from, and I'm talking about Germany there with the distrib distributional consequences that you mentioned, if Germany blocks reforms because it has no political incentives to, to change, then why is the Euro not a failed experiment? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to give uh, the chance for Linda Zailina. You had a question. Um, do you want to, if you want to raise the question? Uh, sorry, Linda, Linda, was that you or was that me signed in as you? I, I think it's my, my colleague. This is Sony Kapoor. Hi. I, okay. think I, I put the question, uh, but I'm signed in as my colleague, Linda. Uh, well, j just a couple of things. So. Uh, one, and I'm sorry I missed the beginning of part of it. One was that, you know, I understand what Martin was saying that, you know, central banks don't really uh, have the, let's call it the, the knowledge to be able to direct expenditure, right? So this is, this firmly belongs to the fiscal side in response to COVID. So, uh, but, but helicopter money comes in, you know, many, many forms. And what Willem and I have suggested is that, you know, there should be, a transfer of 20 to 30 percent of GDP, or whatever the anticipated cost of the crisis is, uh, from the central bank to the fiscal authorities. So the fiscal authorities possess the capacity to direct the expenditure, uh, but but this shouldn't end up uh, as a 20 or 30 percent, you know, higher debt to GDP ratio. And as much as we think that you know large debt to GDP ratios at low interest rates shouldn't really count, the fact of the matter is that is still a ratio that counts. And, and so the best way of going through the crisis is for the fiscal authority to direct the expenditure, but funded by the central bank in a way that doesn't automatically lead to future austerity. Uh, what, 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 what's your answer to that? Okay, um, maybe Peter and Martin, would you? Yeah, so, but in my view, the ECB is simply not allowed to do it. Uh, so the trans transfers are definitely not allowed. So we discussed it before, and I've talked, to, uh, I spoke to some legal guys, and direct transfers from, from the ECB to the governments are simply not, not in line with the treaty. I think there are, two issues here. One is, what does the ECB do? And then how is it accounted for and how is that taken into account in computing the relevant ratios for debt to whatever? Uh, the legal stuff, the legal constraints refer mainly to the former. Uh, I think them Leaving aside this issue that uh, the court's attempts to define limits on monetary financing of governments in terms of ratios of this to that, and these ratios are all, all dysfunctional in the current world, leaving aside that issue, there would be uh, possibilities of handling uh, the matter. So, technically, the real question is, if you think about the fact that, okay, in a single closed economy with a single sovereign, <coughs> fiat money and explicit government debt are just all together, I mean, held in, with the non-government sector, are all just part of paper assets, what I call the bubble issued by the authorities. If we had a rule saying that those parts 
of government debt that are held by the central bank that are not held by the public will not count against whatever ratios we're uh, working with, whatever limits we have on uh, government debt, that would get around that problem. So I think that in terms of uh, finding arrangements that work, it's not hopeless, except that the courts don't understand or don't want to understand that whatever definitions they use and whatever ratios they prescribe may end up tying us all into a very deep hole. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I would like to bring um, Eric back in again, um, if you would like to take up on some of the points and maybe especially uh, Peter's point on the volume of outstanding um, debt and if dual rates wouldn't have big enough of an impact. Yeah, I guess this is, you know there's a real danger in this in this debate, which is very hard. You can you can sort of spin off into high abstraction, or bring it down to to very simple observations. Here's the question I would pose to the panel: um, Why should the ECB let if if European interest rates had been six percent going into this crisis, the ECB would have cut interest rates very very significantly. Now, what would be the what, what, how, why would that conventionally be thought of as a stimulus? Is largely because you you bring down the interest rate on loans, right? We of course we we tend to ignore the fact that the interest rate on savings should come down equivalently, and then you're requiring marginal propensity to consumers, etc., to be different. But let's just the, the the main transmission mechanism we would expect is that the interest rate on loans would come down, which would be a support. Dual interest rates permits an unlimited reduction in the interest rates specifically on loans because dual interest rates are saying the ecb has one interest rate which is the interest rate on reserves which it can influence and and effectively can use under a tiered reserve structure it's able to target money market rates directly money market rates affect the interest rate on your savings deposits right then they have a teltro program which they can use to directly target the interest rates on loans outstanding so the point is is that you don't need any new loans you could reprice all existing loans outstanding under Teltro streams. It's just purely a function of how aggressive you want to be. So let's say standardly in a crisis, you would have cut interest rates by 400 basis points. At a minimum, I'd like to ask the panelists, why don't we reduce the interest rate on outstanding loans by 400 basis points? Now, the reason we don't just do that through money market rates is it would cause the financial system to fail. But the point is, is that dual interest rates get around the zero bound. They get around the reversal rate. So in a sense, we can make this a complex debate about helicopter money. We can keep it really simple, right? We have the tools available to put all outstanding loans in the Eurozone onto negative interest rates. Why aren't they there? Now you may argue, well, maybe they, maybe they shouldn't all be at negative interest rates, but you, you can effectively, you, it, that is conventional under a dual interest rate system. But that's a, that, that to me is the role of monetary policy. Monetary policy is never perfectly targeted and, yeah, and all crises would ideally be dealt with. Any kind of recession would be optimized by better targeting. We're really saying we're just abdicating responsibility here and saying we're just handing it over to somebody else. But we, we've given the central bank the mandate to meet inflation objectives and to sustain aggregate demand. It has tools that would help substantially. They will not solve this problem, but they would help significantly, and they are not being optimized. But if they, have the, if they provide the backstop for the government, that's sufficient. The government does all these things, and if the backstop is then provided by the central bank, why should the central bank interfere so directly with everything? So I, I don't see that. But they always do. They always cut interest rates. I mean, the point is they, they have dramatic interference powers. I mean, there's nothing novel about them interfering. And, it, and I mean, absolutely, we, we want to have government bond markets functioning, and, but fiscal policy should do its job. But just because fiscal policy is doing its job doesn't mean monetary policy doesn't try to do its job better. Those, those aren't, I don't see those as substitutes. I'm 100% I'm, I'm supportive of, of, of the fiscal ideas you're proposing. I'm just saying, I think central banks can do a much better job than they're doing. Okay, so I have to leave now. And nevertheless, I think this dual interest rate idea is very intriguing and I will think more of it. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Peter. You, I know you have to leave. So thank you very much for being here. Um, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Um,
I, I, Eric just mentioned fiscal policy. I don't want to steal any time uh, from the fiscal policy session that is up next. But that's why I would like to give the final words to uh, Daniela Gabor and after that close the session. If you want. Are you unmuted? Yeah, I am. I am sorry. I just, I said I don't want to to go to keep very long. I think uh, we can. I can agree with Eric that uh, the central bank can do many many different things. It's still not very clear to me why sending a check to a bunch of SMEs will really restart aggregate demand uh, in in, a, in pandemic times. And I think fiscal policy needs to be far more uh, uh, sort of uh, significant in driving the cart uh, wherever. But uh, to my mind, central bank is, is quite political. The political dilemmas that it, that, uh, uh, it faces are, are difficult, but if we start from that position, then uh, lots of things are possible. Okay. Great. Thank you so much uh, for all the panelists, um, for this great dis discussion and also for the questions. Um, there are maybe some questions in the Q&A, which I uh, failed to answer. Um, I would maybe the panelists uh, could read them and if uh, possibly i think you can type answers that's also for the next panels uh, if you find time um but i would directly hand over the word to um thomas um who is chairing the next session 